Good evening. I hope you can hear me and not the music anymore. Um, looks good. <laughs> so yeah, that was a little experiment that I did because people have been complaining that the silence before the broadcast starts was so non-helpful because they then never knew if everything was actually working on their side or not. And yeah, well, so I decided let's put some music there. Um, Okay, so welcome to the 37th edition of Octoprint on Air. I'm, as always, your host, Gina Heuske. There's still no B in this name. No, really not. And uh, yeah, well, first of all, uh, Happy New Year, because this is the first live stream that I'm doing this year. Uh, yeah, it took me a while to get through all this vacation stuff, which is why it got delayed and delayed further. And we are now at the end of January, but I still made it. Um, Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? The, the same, actually, as we always talk about on these things. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a short, um, uh, a short summary of what I have been up to the past couple of weeks, or rather, ever since the last one of these, what I'll get up to next. And uh, then we'll have a quick look at the stats, and then we'll have a short Q&A segment. And currently, we only have two questions there because nothing else was in the backlog. Uh, if you have anything to ask uh, during this live stream, just ask it in the usual location. So the live chat is on desktop, either over there and on mobile down there. And yeah, I'll keep an eye on that as usual. Okay, so let's dive right in, I guess. Uh, what I have been up to. Uh, first of all, you knew that, um, or those of you who watched the last one knew that uh, a vacation was very, very much imminent. Uh, the last time uh, that I did one of these. And yeah, well, so that was actually the, the majority of what I did the past uh, almost two months now since, or, or six weeks since, yeah, seven weeks, something like that since the last installment of these. So I took a long vacation, so three weeks, I think. Um, and um, yeah, that was... After that year, that was 2020, that was very, 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 very much needed. Uh, I caught, caught up on my YouTube uh, and movie backlogs. I slept a whole lot. And I also finally fixed my DIY Ambilight setup in my living room, which had been broken for years now. And I finally got it back to working this time using WLED and uh, on an ESP and a Hyperion uh, running on a Pi. And yeah, so it's working great now. And I even have an HDMI switch in between, uh, splitter matrix, whatever you may call it in between so that it works with everything that I throw with it, like Nvidia Shield and PlayStation and the switch. So everything now has a nice ambilight. And that's something that I really missed when the current setup broke or the old setup broke. So yeah, that was really, really nice. And uh, it probably was about the only vacation project that I actually finished, but hey, at least I finished one. What else have I been up to? So um, you might have noticed that about a week ago or so, I think, um, um, almost one and a half, I think, think something like that. Uh, I uh, released a new version, uh, a bug fix release for 1.5 uh, in the form of 1.5.3. And uh, yeah, that was because during my vacation, two bugs started to really cause quite the support overhead, apparently, on the forums, which I also noticed, and in the uh, issue tracker. Um, because it was so that so Octoprint has this detection which you might know about of under voltage conditions on uh, on the Raspberry Pi if it's running on a Raspberry Pi again it does not have to run on a Raspberry Pi but most commonly it runs on a Raspberry Pi and if Octoprint detects it's running on a on a Raspberry Pi and it detects that this Raspberry Pi is reporting under voltage then it will refuse to install updates and it will also refuse to install plugins um, because in the past, we observed that if you do that in case of, oh no, not again. Uh, thanks, uh, Franzi, for the heads up. My, I just got a heads up that my microphone is clipping again because the level is too high. Let's hope it gets, it's better now. Um, or I just try to talk less loud. <clears throat> uh, where was I? Um, right. 
so under voltage, no plugin installs in that case. And the plugin manager detects that and then denies the, uh, the install. The problem was that with 1.5, I also made the whole plugin installation and all that asynchronous. Uh, because it can take quite a while to install some stuff and people were running into timeouts because of that in, the, uh, pr pr in previous versions. And while making stuff asynchronous, I forgot to also somehow report the um, report the uh, errors like under voltage blocking back to the front end, which meant that if you now tried to install a plugin while under voltage is, is, is set up or is active, uh, the plugin manager would deny that request, but you as a user would never learn about that and would look like the plugin manager was just hanging endlessly. And yeah, so that was not a lot of fun um, for a lot of people, I guess, which is why I fixed that, or rather I merged the fix that uh, Charles uh, kindly provided, Charles Powell. And um, the other problem was a similar one uh, in case the, the, the download of whatever you were trying to install failed, you also were uh, facing a stuck uh, plugin manager install dialog and that was fixed by Sean. Uh, or rather, yeah, the fix was provided by Sean and then I merged, uh, I also merged that and then I did some other minor cleanup and pushed out 153. Um, and once I did that, something happened that uh, I, I briefly want to jump up on a soapbox and, and talk about here because it's, it's a repeating pattern and I really wish that it would change again, that it is not as a repeating pattern. Um, because yeah, immediately after I pushed out 153, a lot of people started like, I just updated uh, from 152 to 1.53 and now my um, Octoprint cannot connect to my printer anymore or the web interface doesn't load or my cat started cutting up a hairball and it, the plugin is, uh, the, the update, update is at fault. And um, yeah, in that case, just let me, quickly remind everyone there are there is a change log so if you run into some issue after an update then from version x to version y then it might make sense to actually check whether the update can be the fault of this issue or if it might just be coincidence um, because in this specific case there were a ton of reports once again like with every single update and especially now with the bug fixes, bug fix uh, only updates that I push out where people complain about bugs introduced by an update in components of Octoprint, which weren't even touched with a 10 foot pole. So what I am asking everyone who runs into an issue with Octoprint and wants help with that or wants to report it, then please verify that it actually is related to an update that you did. And if you think it is, then please tell us uh, on the community forums and on the issue tracker, not only that you updated to a version, but also from which version you updated from, because this is also part of the pattern. And this also is important for us, uh, and especially for me, who is usually, usually the one who has to analyze this stuff, um, to uh, to um, know in order to, to figure out what might be the cause of whatever happened there. And uh, so that is, yeah, this is, absolutely crucial. Do not just say, I updated and now something doesn't work. Do say, I updated from X to Y and now Z doesn't work. And do not say it must be the update when you are not 100% sure that it is actually the update, which yeah, um, you can only actually verify by rolling back and going back and forth a couple of times. And yeah, so yeah, you, you could save everyone involved with Octoprint support and issue fixing and all that a lot of time if you just spend the time to actually read the bloody change logs that I put out with every single release candidate and full release. Because frankly, yeah, it would also, I mean, I do not write these for fun. They are far from being fun to write, actually. It, it usually costs me like half a day to a full day to write these change logs. And I try to make them so that everyone can understand what was changed, where it was changed, why it was changed. So um, yeah, a lot of the issues that recently came up where, where people assumed something got broken by an update or something like that would have been immediately solved if they had just looked into the change logs. So please read the change log, please don't make assumptions, and please give us all the information that we need. Thank you. That was that just needed to be said here. Um, yeah, and 
adding up, adding on to that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm still on my soapbox, I just realized, um, is also something that I noticed over the past couple of weeks, months, maybe even. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, in general, uh, people are more on edge, are more quickly to assume malice on my part or on part of anyone else when something doesn't work or uh, whatever. And yeah, I, I get it. I mean, we are all quite, um, uh, yeah, quite uh, weighed down heavily by this whole pandemic situation going on and it's influencing all of our normal day lives quite intensely and this weighs heavily on everyone i get it i mean i'm i'm not a i'm not an exception here either and i notice on myself as well that i tend to get more easily frustrated and more easily angry uh, these days um but even uh, or especially in this in this kind of situation uh, i would really like to ask of the whole community to just try our all all of our bests to first of all assume the good in people and to see the human on the other side that we're talking to because all of us are human we are not talking to robots here or to machines that are just outputting code uh, when you feed them food and there are no feelings involved in anything and just do not just jump in and vent our frustrations with some situation on the next best person we encounter which usually is the first person trying to help you on the forums for example and instead try to just collaborate and be friendly and vent in private um because yeah i i think the world right now is weird and crazy and scary enough and uh we really do not need to make it more crazy and scary uh, by starting to attack each other all the time and this is a pattern that i see on on the forums in the issue tracker on twitter everywhere and at least where i have a say which is the forums and the issue tracker please try to um uh yeah take these words uh at face value and try to um do your best like i do my best to be kind and remember the human and be excellent to each other yeah, so I had to get this off my chest. Um, yeah, because it was a bit too much in the last couple of weeks. Um, okay, back to what I was, what I have been working on uh, also the past couple of weeks, apart from uh, jumping up on my soapbox here and there about people not being kind to each other. Uh, so obviously, I've been working on what is what is going to be come one six zero. Uh, there were various bug fixes and improvements from during my vacation that were in the pull request uh, queue, so to speak, and I went through all of them. I think I went through all of them actually now <laughs> and um, and uh, fixed what needed fixing or, or asked what needed asking and then merged when everything was in a clear. And I also fixed most of the issues that were, support, uh, were reported during this time as well. There are still three, I think, that I need to figure out what is going on there. But yeah, th those are the, the, the not the, the not low hanging fruits. So yeah, it's going to, to be fun. Um, but I also implemented something that I hope a lot of you will find exciting as much as I do um, or will find as exciting as I do. Uh, and it was actually a suggestion by my Boulder buddy Romses, uh, who I think is not today, he, uh, is not here today. At least I have not yet seen him in the, uh, show up in the chat. But uh, yeah, it's, it's also been a suggestion that has been floating around for a while in Octoprint. Uh, and uh, I finally figured out how best to do it. So uh, let me quickly switch you over to my screen. So. This is a development build of Octoprint 1.6, as you can see down here. And in Octoprint 1.5, I introduced this fancy little new system thing down here, which brings you this screen with system information. And in 1.6, this little button here was added as well. And if you click that, it will download an Octoprint system info and then a timestamp.zip file, which you can save. And inside that zip file is everything that you see here, plus auto print log, plus serious, serial log, plus plugin manager, uh, the plugin manager log, the software update log, and if you're currently connected to a printer, also the output of uh, the, the current content of the terminal. So all the stuff that we usually try to get from users when uh, they ask for support or when they open a bug tracker, uh, a, bug, a bug on the tracker, but 
which can be a bit of a challenge, especially for newbies to collect. So now they have this dip. What do, what do they do now with it? So the first idea is they can just throw it into an issue directly, just upload it. And then a little GitHub action will turn it into, or will add a little link down here. So for example, uh, if I just upload what I just created, which should be that one, I think. This is now being uploaded to the uh, Git issue. Now I can comment it. And now it will take a while and I will uh, something like maybe half a minute or so. And I hope it actually works this time because I had a bit of, 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 of a trigger issue for uh, earlier with this bot. But um, it should now do this. So it, it, is, it, it has detected that this is an, is, is, is a, is a um, is an octoprint system info bundle and has generated this link. And what does this link now do? This link leads to the very first React app that I ever wrote, which is the octoprint bundle viewer. And the octoprint bundle viewer is a, a React application that com runs completely entirely in your browser, downloads the zip files that it gets um, via the URL parameter, or which you can alternatively also upload directly to it and then unpacks it and presents all the information therein in a way that we can actually quickly parse it. So for example, we have the system information here, but it also has extracted the important stuff up here, like Octoprint version, Python version. If this was from an Octopi um, setup, it was from a Windows development machine, but if it was from Octopi, it would also list the Octopi version up here. It will also uh, open up the log file and tell you how many chars and lines are in there, uh, has some basic syntax highlighting so that you can quickly see uh, errors. For example, here I broke something <laughs> intentionally, uh, things like that. And you also see it, it scrolls fairly nicely. So that works as well. And in case of the serial log, it will also display this if the serial log has not been enabled by the user, which is also a common um, problem that we have that we tell people we need a serial log from you. And then they upload it, but it's the empty one. So at least this time we can quickly and easily see that and do not have to guess um, from the uh, from the um, URL uh, from the uh, size. And uh, as I said, you can also uh, upload a system info a system bundle, and that works just as well. And uh, I also just before I started this, um, before I started this uh, live stream, I also just implemented something similar for the forum. So here there is currently a little demo topic on the staff sub forum, uh, and I pasted and I, I uploaded a system bundle there too, and I got this view bundling generated right after. And when I click on that the same happens. So um, that way, I hope it will be quite easy to get people to share what we actually need to help them. Uh, so they can just download it, dump it in an issue, or dump it directly in the forum. I just I still need to up the, the upload limit a bit on the forum. But apart from that, everything works. And then we have all of this information and can hopefully help more quickly. Uh, that's the idea here. Yeah. And uh, back to me, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, apart from this being a nifty tool, I think, uh, because the alternative would have been that everyone who wants to look into one of these zipped bundles would have been to download it, unzip it locally, then open it up and all that. And this way, we can just immediately watch it, uh, view it in the, in the browser right away. And this also works on mobile and all that. Um, so apart from this uh, very nice workflow, I think, for, for developers and, and people who want to analyze tickets and, and whatnot, um, it was also a very, very important lesson for me because uh, I'm actually currently evaluating whether React is going to be what will power the next version of Octoprint's UI. And this was the very first project that I actually built with it. And the experience so far was quite nice. So thumbs up, I guess. Um, yeah. 
so currently, uh, the bundle viewer does not have, any, as I said, it runs completely in a browser, so it doesn't really have a backend or anything. It's basically a static page. Um, and currently, it doesn't need to have a backend. Uh, but if in the long run, something doesn't work out about this attaching stuff to tickets uh, um, approach that I currently run there, or if we maybe want to add some more automation where a ticket gets created for you automatically or something like that, and we need issues, uh, we need storage for that, then this can still be changed. Um, but for now, it's completely um, yeah, limited to the browser itself, all client side, and works just great that way. So yeah, that is quite nice. And another thing that I did is um, I did some further uh, migration of stuff to GitHub Actions. So uh, you might know about the Git issue bot that uh, monitors the, the issues or so far monitored the issue tracker on, on Octoprint. And if you did not fully fill out the tip, uh, the ticket, ticket template or, or deleted certain parts of it rather, um, it would tell you, hey, by the way, I need this full ticket template uh, filled out. And if you want to uh, actually not report a bug or anything, that's fine too. Then just go here and here and all that. And um, that was still powered by a, a little bot in Python that I built about six years ago or so, and which was showing its age and was only running as a cron job that po regularly pulled the GitHub API and did its best to detect new issues, but sometimes failed doing that. And also did its best to close issues when the information had not been provided within 14 days or something. And yeah, usually failed at that too. So I still had to manually close everything. And yeah, that is the reason why for a long time now, I wanted to move this over to, to, to an, another implementation that would just be push-based and um, ideal, ideally run as a GitHub action. And I finally did that. So um, the Git issue bot is no more. It has been replaced by a bunch of GitHub actions now, uh, some of which I had to write myself, some of which I could just take and recombine uh, in order for my workflow to work. And uh, that is really nice. The response times by the bot are now way faster because they just, yeah, they get triggered right away when an issue is posted. And um, uh, it's also easier to adapt to for other projects as well, I think now, because uh, it's it's a it's a full, full featured GitHub action that you can just publish in your own project and you reuse and it can be configured and all that. And I'm planning to, um, write a blog post about it as well, how I did that and, and why, and some, some background information and all that so that people can replicate the setup if they want to. Um, I also, I actually already started on that, but then life happened again, or rather uh, issues happened again. And so uh, uh, some other stuff needs attention, but I hope that I can get it out within the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. And that was about all that I did ever since I got back from vacation about two, three, wait, two weeks ago. Oh, I think two weeks ago, <laughs> or three, almost three, maybe. Um, okay. Yeah. So what are the next steps? Uh, obviously there's still some work, more work to do on 160. As I just mentioned, there are still three bucks at least, which I need to figure out what is up there. Um, and there are also some requests uh, that I want to implement for 160. Currently, I'm trying to wrap my hand, head around one of uh, uh, one of the bugs that is a Safari issue, uh, only with very old versions of Safari. But right now, I can't really make heads nor tails of it. So yeah, just wish me luck, please, I guess. And I also obviously want to finally find some time to work on 2.0 again. Um, this is really a never ending story of trying to get back into it and then getting uh, overrun with all the regular madness, apparently. But uh, yeah, at least some uh, more um, uh, Python 2 compatibility has now been removed from the co code uh, that is going to be 2.0, so the devil branch, thanks to uh, my um, uh, uh, fellow Python developer, uh, Eumiro, <laughs> um, who I actually got the had the pleasure to meet at uh, PyCon DE two years ago. Now two years ago, yeah, 1919, uh, 19, yeah, right, 2019, when 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 the world was still normal, uh, and we we could still meet in person at conferences, right? Um, so yeah, so there is progress. It's just slow progress. And uh, what I also need to do is um, so these these compatibility fixes that I got from uh, Miro. Um, uh, also, also gave me some heads up on another bunch of stuff that might 
make its way back into devil if uh, I merge from maintenance, if I merge any fixes or improvements from maintenance, which is still two and three compatible. So what I want to do here is um, uh, extend the, the library of code mods that I created a while, a while ago. Uh, so I don't know if you, if I mentioned it, I think I mentioned it, but it's been a while. Uh, I created a bunch of code modification tools that will detect certain code patterns in Octoprint source or in any source, actually in any Python source, um, and, uh, allow to rewrite them into better patterns. So stuff like, I don't know, uh, um, for example, if you write, write something like if not foo in bar instead of if foo not in bar. Uh, the, the letter is a bit more performance, so you want to do that actually. And um, so uh, what I created there was a bunch of libraries that, uh, or a bunch of, of, of routines that parse the, the source code, detect these kind of patterns, and then replace them with uh, the, the fixed version. And I will need to write some more of these now for the changes that Miro brought up, which I wasn't aware of, uh, a bunch of um, exception classes that got merged into one and uh, things like uh, new uh, literal definitions for creating dictionaries from generators and all that. So this is stuff that should be qu quite nicely uh, automatable. I just need to write some code mods for that. So that will be maybe one or two days, but it's something that I really want to do because it, in the end it will save way, way, way more time than that uh, while we still have to stay compatible to Python 2 on the maintenance branch, which we'll have to do until we release 2.0, which as I just noted, will be a way out because 2020 happened. Um, Originally, the plan had been uh, to, to go for uh, a stable or a, a, at least a first release candidate or something of 2.0 around March, April of this year. But yeah, the last year was just crazy. And this year so far has not been very much better. But I'm doing my best. That's all I can do. Um, and another thing that I really want to get done sooner rather than later, and EDL before 2.0 gets uh, even more um prominent is uh, a plug-in sanity check action. Uh, I think I mentioned that before as well, something that a plug-in author can just throw into the workflow files if they have their stuff hosted on GitHub, I, I have to add, and which will test their plug-in with Octoprint's current stable maintenance and maybe also the devil version and try to al uh, alarm or warn about any kind of problems. Uh, so exceptions that suddenly pop up or um, stuff that gets detected is no longer being supported, for example, hook changes or something like that. So that is the, the goal here. Um, I just have to sit out and uh, sit down and actually find the, find the time to write it. Yep. Um, that was what the next steps currently are, or rather the, the next planned steps, because usually, um, yeah, it, it doesn't stay the way that I planned it. Um, so next is a quick look at the stats. So I'm going to share my screen with you again and switch you over to this. And uh, yeah, so there is not that much unusual to see here, uh, just that the numbers are constantly rising. Uh, we see that around here, the 153 um, took over 152 uh, in the distribution across the whole user base, um, the Python 3, um, the Python 3, uh, um, how, how do I say, ratio <laughs> is climbing as well. So we are now at, I don't know, yeah, 17 point, almost 18% of all, uh, of all instances who, uh, which, which are now running Python 3, which obviously is also um, helped by that's something I totally forgot about things that happened. Octopi 018 got released stable and Octopi 018 uh, gets shipped with Python 3. Uh, no more Python 2 on that one. I mean, yeah, the system image still supports Python 2, but Octoprint, Octoprint's virtual environment on that is Python 3 now. So over the course of the past two months, we went from um, only 5K Python 3 instances to uh, 
almost 10k per, uh, I think this is per, per day, per day, yeah, seen instances per day. So this is total instances seen during this time, and this is instant, this unique instances per day, which is why this number is a bit lower. Um, because an instance might be online here, which wasn't online there, and vice versa. Uh, yeah, the, the printed hours are still yeah around the same as always. So I, I, I think last time we, we were also aware around 120 years of, of total print time across seven days. Um, and that is about what I wanted to show here. Um, what I also want to remind everyone is that since about two months now, there is data.octoprint.org where you can also find some of these stats, not as fancy in a Grafana um, instance and all that, but still the most important stuff you can also access here, like the Python 2 versus 3 uh, st uh, uh, distribution and also the individual version distribution here um, and the Octoprint version distribution and then unique instance count per, I think, per hour. Yeah, per hour uh, across all these. Uh, across seven and across 30 days. So if you want to look at stats whenever you want to, and not only when I do these broadcasts, this is where I want to go. Yeah. Uh, and I also want to look into expanding that or rather have other people expand that because this is also posted on, I think the link is down here. Yeah, this is sources at github.octoprint, blah, blah. Um, Although I have to admit, I also briefly thought about whether I should whip up some React page for that as well. But yeah, so far I haven't. Um, if someone else wants, be my guest. Um, yeah, and that brings us actually to the um, to the Q and A segment. So I'm, I'm taking a quick look at the live chat. If I missed something, any kind of questions back to what I talked about so far, but I don't think so. Okay, uh, and I actually want to get myself back into the picture as well. Hi. Um, yeah, okay, so as I said, we had two questions this time in the backlog, and uh, the first one is a quite long one, and I'm still going to read all of it, uh, from John. I'm getting a lot of feedback from people using Clipper that they are preferring a web UI called main cell because they find Octoprint too heavy. On the latest iterations, I found Octoprint to be reasonably snappy, but could some latency be due to older Pi versions or Wi-Fi instead of Ethernet connectivity? I'm only running it on Pi 3 and 4 these days and not the original or 2 versions. Do you run benchmarks to keep track of performance on different supported platforms at all? Uh, so yeah, I, let's, let's start with the first part of this question, whether that could be uh, because of older Pi versions or Wi-Fi or something. Yeah, I mean, it could be old Pi versions. It could be people insisting on using a Python 0W, even though I sound like a broken record not to use that. Um, it could be ancient Raspberry Pis. It could be Wi-Fi issues. It can be a ton of plug-ins overwhelming the, the poor little thing. It can be uh, quite a lot of things. Um, personally, I run and test Octoprint uh, on, Pi uh, on, on, on Raspberry Pi 3s, so not even the Plus model, but the, the, the stock 3 one, um, which is the recommended minimum hardware. So if you look on the download page of Octoprint, it will tell you that a Raspberry Pi 3 is recommended, or 4, because people then were like, what, can we not use the 4? You can use the 4, but a minimum of a Raspberry Pi 3 is recommended. Um, and personally, I cannot say that I have noticed anything being sluggish or heavy or, or unusually slow or anything like that. So as I said, I use it myself. I have two printers here, three actually, but the third one is currently not in, in working shape uh, with, uh, with Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 3s and, and, and Octoprint 153 on them. And I use them and I use Octoprint on them, so I eat my own dog food, and so far it seems to work fine for me. Um, and yeah, that being said, I do not run dedicated automated performance tests on all kinds of Raspberry Pis. I do not have the setup for that here, and uh, frankly, I wouldn't also right now not know how to do that. Uh, I mean, uh, how to where to get the time for that and where to get the space to put a bunch of hardware to have constantly on for tests like this. Um, what I do, though, is I have these end-to-end -end tests that are powered by Cypress, uh, which run 
on every single push that I do to the code base and also on every single release, release candidate and pull request and everything. And they also have some timeouts. So if stuff really got noticeably slower, at least the most the most common stuff like loading the interface and all that, I think that would would show up in failing tests there. Um, yeah, and finally, the I I also trust uh, that the people who help testing the release candidates uh, will also tell me if they notice something being off. Uh, so I do not want to depend on just me thinking, oh, this is snappy enough. But I actually hope that people will also tell me, hey, by the way, uh, the interface now takes two minutes to load. This is weird. This was not like that before. And this is also what the release, release candidates are about. It's not just to figure out if there are bugs. It's also to figure out if there are release, uh, if there are performance regressions, if the, if, if, features that were added maybe interfere with workflows, stuff like this. So all of this is something that release candidates can take care of and hopefully also do. I'm not entirely sure, of course, because yeah, um, it could also be that a lot of people are having issues and are not just reporting them back, <laughs> which kind of defeats the purpose of running a release candidate, but I've seen this. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I just hope that uh, that stuff like that will make its way back to me as well. So yeah, uh, also something that I recently noticed with one of my own piles, and actually the one that I use for the update tests, or not the the one, but one of the two that I use for the automated update tests that I do. Okay, suddenly the, the light turned on. <laughs> that was the the uh, movement sensor. Um, uh, which is that, uh, yeah, one of the Pi 3s, uh, the, the Wi-Fi is just shot for some reason now. Uh, I actually just today got a, a replacement unit and I got a B plus in this case because I couldn't get a B anymore. Um, but yeah, I hope that that will fix it because it's it's always the same unit that, 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 that causes me issues during updating uh, because it constantly loses Wi-Fi access or the Wi-Fi has packet loss uh, to no end. So my current guess is it's that and I will go, I will, I will, I will swap that thing and, and hope that it fixes this uh, because the exact same image flashed to the Pi right next to it <laughs> works. Same version, same everything. It's just a different Pi underneath. So this is just obviously just uh, like hearsay or or whatnot or or circumst circumstantial evidence or whatever you may call it, but at least from personal experience, I can now say that apparently some pies also can have flaky Wi-Fi or can develop flaky Wi-Fi or at least this is the current hypothesis hypothesis theory <laughs> now hip ha, hypothesis. This is a very 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 complicated word word in English for for a German native speaker. Um, yeah, but. So long story short, currently I'm not aware of any general slowdowns introduced by any kind of the uh, any of the recent updates. I'm pretty confident also that I would get notifications about that or reports of this during the RC phase. Uh, a lot of factors overall play into load times and whatnot, uh, which are completely outside of my control, like the Pi that you use, the Wi-Fi at your home, uh, the reception of whatever client device you're using to connect to that to said Wi-Fi as well, obviously, stuff like that, and also how many plugins you have installed. Uh, that being said, Octoprint is more heavy weighted uh, than something like Mainsail simply because it tries to do more. Uh, and I'm not trying to I don't know. I'm not trying to dis Mainsail here. Mainsail is a wonderful project as far as I'm aware. I have not personally run it yet, uh, but I, I I heard about it and, and checked it out. And I actually even had a brief email conversation with uh, with the dev. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is not a dis of Mainsail. Mainsail has a goal and it accomplishes this goal quite nicely as far as I can say, we, uh, see, which is to, uh, to, to accommodate Clipper. Octoprint is pretty much a whole full-blown platform. So it has a completely different goal. It's not trying to talk to one specific firmware. It needs to talk to all of the firmwares and ideally which are the, without the user having to configure anything because a lot of them are overwhelmed if I tell them you have to check all these checkboxes in order so they match your firmware because they usually don't even know what firmware they run. And on top of that, um, 
I also have this plugin system in there, which means on the one hand, you can uh, have Octoprint do stuff that I never envisioned and would never be able to maintain or implement myself because I lack hardware or time or whatnot. But this also means that extension hooks I have to put uh, I, uh, that that yeah I have to put in extension hooks which also read up the resources I have to put in error checking around these extension hooks because plugin authors can make mistakes and I do not want a third party plugin to take down the whole platform ideally I mean sometimes it still happens but the goal is that a plugin cannot take down the whole platform and of course these error checks also eat up resources so all of this combined means Octoprint is will always be more heavyweighted than something like Mainsail. Uh, so if you do not want or need all the bells and whistles that Octoprint as a platform provides, then by all means use something else. I'm not going to put a gun to the head of people and say you need to use Octoprint because otherwise you, I don't know, you, you are stupid or something. No, I mean, use whatever works best for you. And uh, I'm actually glad that there is another project uh, or that are other projects that approach all this thing at a different angle so um yeah that's about what i can say to that uh what what i could maybe think about in the long term is maybe build myself another raspberry pi rack uh configure github remote action runners on there or or configure a, a, a local a drone io instance here in my own lan or something and try to run performance tests against octopi images flash to that but mm, I'm not entirely sure if basically like crowdsourcing set performance tests during RC phases and all that wouldn't doesn't work better because yeah it just is a way bigger test pool and way more workflows that get checked and way more combinations of hardware and software and firmware and plugins and whatnot that gets checked and that strikes me as a bit more promising to achieve uh, the the goal of figuring out if stuff is actually uh, performing well or perceived as forming, performing well but then again yeah maybe maybe something like at least checking some API endpoints are returning stuff in a meaningful time would be a good idea I don't know right now I frankly do not know where to find the time for that as well <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah that would be that question and now on to the second question also by John uh, I saw Creality became a sponsor for Octoprint, and that is really good news. Congratulations. But what does this mean concretely besides financial support for the project? Well, right now it only means, it only means financial support. Um, I'm absolutely not against more close collaboration with Creality, uh, especially considering the amount of support overhead that some problems um, with specifically their printer hardware and firmware seems to generate in our forums so i would love to get some kind of uh, dialogue going there but so far it's only and i say only in in quotes uh, because uh, the 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 financial support actually does help a whole ton uh, so i i do not want to diminish it in any way but right now it's limited limited <laughs> to that um yeah okay um that was actually all the questions that I had. And so let me quickly look at the live chat. Yeah, Jim says a software design for a single firmware will always be more performant than one that supports multiple filmers. That's obviously also uh, true. Um, but I think that was that. Yeah, I think that's all so far. Okay, so um, then Let's go back there. Oh, also, I don't know if you noticed this, but there is a little octo... Oh, I never know how to put my finger back there. Um, there's a little octoprint plushie sitting there, which I got as a present from Daniel Craw for, for Christmas. And I'm, I'm still totally happy about that little guy. And it, it totally made my day and week and all that when I got it. So yeah, just I, I just wanted you to notice it because it's absolutely completely awesome. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, so the usual um, housekeeping stuff. Uh, the next regular one of these I will try to do 
somewhere in some sometime around in a month. So at the end of February, it might turn into the very start of March. I cannot promise right now uh, because I do not know how my calendar will look and all that around that. But the goal is to make it in something like four weeks. Uh, I will post the appointment on Patreon as usual uh, so that those of you on the $5 and up level can attend it live if you want to. And also, if you are watching this live right now, which you probably are because I have not released the recording yet, um, is uh, I'll be participating in another live stream in half an hour and no, not in half an hour, in, in, at uh, 6.30. So right now that's in 45 minutes. Um, and I already pasted the, the link into the YouTube description, at least I hope it that I did. Uh, I clicked, I edited it and I clicked save, but I could, I did not have the time anymore to check if it actually made it in there. Um, but I check right away when I'm done with this. And uh, yeah, I, I'll be in another live stream with a fellow GitHub star, Eddie, um, uh, where we'll basically talk about, uh, yeah, about all, all, about life as an open source developer and all that. So I'm not entirely sure what awaits me, but uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, then maybe just stay on YouTube and take a look there. Uh, and uh, Franzi just confirmed that indeed, yes, I did put it in there. Perfect. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's about that. Um, uh, there are still no questions or anything. Oh yeah, uh, that one is not not for sale actually. Yeah, so that was a, a, a one of a kind thing that he he had made and then added some more stuff. So I think that the the mouth was laser cut by himself and and yeah. So that really 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 awesome. Um, but if I ever uh if i ever make a, a line of plushies i will be sure uh, everyone knows who wants one <laughs> um okay so i think that means we are done here for now at least and i can still get ready for this the, the thing in about half an hour um yeah uh, i'm really really glad that you made it <laughs> those of you who made it and uh, i hope it was interesting as always uh thank you for being here and as always, until next time, stay healthy, wear a mask, wash your hands and all that. And obviously, most importantly, happy printing. Bye.